door is a portal back in time. There lies some amazing history through here. Your guide is waiting inside. It's Maggie Philbin with a collection of antiques for tomorrow's world. If we look back over the last 30 years, the greatest innovations have come in the world of personal electronics. Things like computers, calculators, even digital watches. It seems as though tomorrow's world has arrived without us really noticing. Like everybody else, I enjoy the challenge of testing my reflexes against the speed of the machine. And See what I mean? That was me just 20 years ago on Tomorrow's World. It might seem a surprise that one of the biggest instigators of this change was based here in Cambridge, Clive Sinclair. He's probably best remembered for his C5 car. But over a period of more than 30 years, he's been responsible for all manner of electronic devices. Although once laughed at, he was actually the first to do something we now associate with the Japanese, make electronics look trendy. The C5 now has a cult status, and surviving examples are sought after. In fact, all of Sinclair's creations have now become collector's items, perhaps not valuable yet, but followed with a fanatical fervour. It's extraordinary to think that just 35 years ago, if you wanted a bit of help with your maths, you had to rely on weird and wonderful machines like these, which were either cumbersome, complicated to use, or very expensive. But then, along came something completely different. This gem of a museum in Cambridge called the Whipple has a great collection of calculators, which are all much of a muchness, really, except for one, which really stands out. Here it is. It's the Sinclair Executive. It's slim and contemporary-looking, which is ironical, because this was made over 30 years ago, and many people feel it's the world's first true pocket calculator. I'm the operator. In 1972, they cost £69 plus VAT, a fortune, which is why they're now so rare. Rodney Cocker, original. Now, you bought one of these very early calculators, and they were really expensive. Why did you buy it? The thought that this was modern technology was probably more impressive than the actual use of the machine itself. And also, of course, it only had an add, uh, subtract, multiply and divide function. And so, you know, it was limited. But having said that, when you whipped it out, it was like the m m latest mobile phone. You know, look what I've got. It's, uh, it's where we're going in the 20th century. So in future, computers like this one will have greater speed and far more elaborate functions. And of course, I was absolutely right. Most of us do have a computer now, and we use them for far more than space invaders. Back in 1980, almost no one had a home computer, but Clive Sinclair was about to change all of that. There was the ZX80, then the ZX81. Not the first microcomputers, but certainly the first that were affordable. And as a result, they became the world's biggest selling machines. The ZX81 sold for just £70. As a designer employed by Sinclair, Rick Dickinson was behind the look of many of the products. He still runs a design studio near Cambridge and is passionate about the man and his inventions. It wasn't just the fact that this sort of thing hadn't been done before. It was so completely off the wall. You know, companies just don't operate like this. I mean, I remember, for example, um, I mean, can you believe it? This, this product went out in kit form originally, and we thought we might sell a thousand a month. And I think when this product went out of uh, production, I think it was something like eighty thousand a month. We were knee deep in checks, and each one for around about a hundred pounds. It was stunning. The cash flow was um, the antithesis of probably most normal organisations. And of course, that that was. A complete surprise, I should think, because I would imagine Clive thought that this was a hobbyist product. People really took to it, and this um, this money allowed us to retool, um, and we came out with the ZX81, which was uh, more compact, more powerful, uh, more professional in every sense. Then came the Sinclair Spectrum computer. With its colour screen, it sold in huge quantities and was perhaps one of the first machines to make sophisticated computer games really popular. Now they're collectible. You can still pick them up for a few pounds, although rarer items can fetch hundreds. 
Andy Kavanagh has quite a collection. Well, when I first got the computer, um, obviously it was bought for me to use um, to do homework and educational programs and things like that. And obviously there are games for it. There was a couple of games that came with it, and I did spend quite a large proportion of my time actually playing those games. After a while, I think my parents must have noticed that I was using it more and more for games and less and less for what they probably intended it um, And the amount of time I could spend on it um, was restricted somewhat. This is a Spectrum emulator running on my PC. Um, it loads games in the same way that a Spectrum would. Um, it uses a file on the computer which is a sort of copy of the original cassette tape and it does all the cassette noises and all the coloured bars and everything the same way as the um, original Spectrum would. Uh, one thing it doesn't emulate is a problem which most Spectrum users seem to have in that um, the game would stop loading um, if their mum walked into the room while it was loading. Um, it seems to be some magic phenomenon where there's a mystical aura surrounding the computer which when broken by a parent um, seems to prevent the game from working. One particular game which was incredibly popular back then was a game called Football Manager and um, it sold, I think it was the first game to ever sell a million copies and it made the um, programmer um, Kevin Toms um, quite rich. A lot of people feel that um, games these days um, aren't as good as they used to be. They've got better graphics, they're faster, but um, they seem to lack the gameplay. I mean, I remember buying a game uh, for my computer and I'd play it for weeks and weeks, whereas these days new ones would last me maybe a few days. And although they're good, there's not as much thought put into them in terms of trying to make them new and exciting. I would say that if it wasn't for Clive Sinclair, the home computer market would be 10 years behind what it is now. Clive Sinclair is most remembered for the C5, which hardly sold at all in 1985, but is now highly collectible. The C5 Owners Club is based at Watton in Norfolk. It's a good job too. The C5 doesn't like going uphill. They're getting harder to find, yeah. Um, but on the internet now, you can find anything. So if you had, didn't have the internet, you might have a lot of trouble finding them. He was trying to create a revolutionary type of transport, but he wasn't trying to create an electric car. He was trying to find a replacement for a push bike, basically. He was trying to do something that everyone else was frightened to death of doing. And if it had been launched in a different way, slower pace, I think he would have succeeded, but the media attention it got, um, they just crucified it. In today's greener climate, the C5 may have stood more of a chance, and you can see how in a congested city like Cambridge, it could have gone down quite well. Personally, I think it's a tragedy that a man like Sinclair is now for his failure and is derided as a figure of fun by people who don't possess an ounce of his creativity or vision. Who said these personal electric vehicles would never take off? And apparently Clive Sinclair is about to launch the son of C5. Well, that's it for this week. If there's anything you want to talk about, you can log on to our website. It's www.bbc.co.uk slash inside out. And in just a moment, I'll be on your BBC local radio station. You can give me a call. The number's 0845 30 50 007.